As the financial world eagerly awaited Warren Buffett's latest 13F filing for the third quarter of 2023, the old man surprised everyone. Buffett, the sage investor renowned for his steady hand and strategic maneuvers, revealed a surprising trend. He's been selling a lot. In this video, we're about to unravel the mysteries behind Warren Buffett's recent sell-off spree, dissecting the 13 stocks he bid farewell to, seven of which he completely divested from. It's a move that has left many scratching their heads, given Buffett's reputation for long-term buy-and-hold strategies. I'm not recommending that people buy stocks today or tomorrow or next week or next month. I think it all depends on your circumstances, but you shouldn't buy stocks unless you expect, in my view, you, you expect to hold them for a very extended period, and you are prepared financially and psychologically to hold them the same way you would hold a farm and never look at a quote and never, uh, never pay it. You don't need to pay attention to them. I mean, the main thing to do, uh, and you're not going to pick the bottom, and you're not going to. Nobody else can pick it for you or anything of the sort. You've got to be prepared to, when you buy a stock to have it go down 50 percent. Or more. But before we get to the heart of the matter, let's take a stroll down memory lane. A time when every move of Buffett was a market event. A time when his investing prowess was revered and unquestionable. Cut to the present, and the narrative seems to be shifting. In the third quarter of 2023, the 13F filing painted a picture of Buffett as a net seller, raising eyebrows and prompting a myriad of questions. What prompted this sudden shift in strategy? Has the investing landscape changed so drastically that even Buffett, the titan of Wall Street, felt compelled to adjust his sales? To truly grasp the essence of Buffett's decision-making, we need to go over the stocks he sold and dissect his unique investing process. It is a process that has made him one of the wealthiest individuals on the planet. Understanding how he values stocks and navigates the complex world of financial markets is key to unraveling the reasons behind this unexpected liquidation. So, buckle up as we embark on a journey into the mind of Warren Buffett, unraveling the motives behind his stock-selling spree. Now, let's uncover the curtain on the quartet of stocks that Warren Buffett bid adieu to, starting with the household name Procter & Gamble. In the previous quarter, Berkshire Hathaway's 35,400 shares, valued at around $47 million, were completely liquidated. A surprising move, considering the long-standing history between Buffett and this consumer goods giant. Another heavyweight in Buffett's portfolio that took an exit stage left was Johnson & Johnson. With a tenure dating back to 2006, Berkshire Hathaway had around 327,000 shares, totaling about $54 million at the end of the second quarter. The question echoing through the financial corridors is, why part ways with a stalwart in the healthcare conglomerate arena? But the plot thickens as we shift our attention to the global shipping and logistics titan, UPS. A relationship dating back to 2006, Berkshire Hathaway held a substantial 59,400 shares worth approximately $105 million. What led Buffett to sever ties with a company deeply entrenched in the backbone of global commerce? And finally, we arrive at Mondelez International, a global food company boasting iconic snack brands like Oreo. Berkshire Hathaway's 578,000 shares, valued at around $42 million at the close of quarter two, have vanished from the portfolio. What drove Buffett to offload his entire stake in this snack giant? And what connects these seemingly diverse industries? The answer? lies in the complex dance between stocks and bonds, a dance where interest rates dictate the rhythm. Warren Buffett, the quintessential value investor, is guided by the teachings of Benjamin Graham, author of The Intelligent Investor. Graham's wisdom emphasizes the perpetual evaluation of the value proposition in the stock market versus the allure of the bond market. Buffett's decisions aren't driven by whims. They are rooted in a careful assessment of risk-adjusted returns. As interest rates soar, pushing yields on bonds to multi-decade highs, the Oracle of Omaha reevaluated his portfolio. Take Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, UPS, and Mondelez International, once considered blue-chip dividend stocks. Their yields, however, paled in comparison to the rising bond yields, now comfortably perched at 4.4%. 
The philosophy is clear. If stock yields fall below bond yields, the risk-reward balance tips unfavorably. And that's precisely what happened. Buffett, in a strategic move, divested from these dividend-paying giants, redirecting the funds into the safety of bonds. The result? A higher risk-free return on Berkshire Hathaway's capital. In a nutshell, Buffett's pivot to bonds isn't merely a reaction to market shifts. It's a calculated move aligning with the fundamental principles of value investing. Berkshire Hathaway's third quarter report speaks volumes, revealing a significant shift toward bonds, a testament to Buffett's astute financial acumen in navigating the ever-changing seas of the investment world. Now that we've unveiled the quartet of stocks that Warren Buffett bid farewell to, let's delve into his investment philosophy. In a 2001 talk at Georgia University, Buffett distilled his unique approach to intrinsic value, a principle that guides his decisions across various asset classes. Well, intrinsic value is what is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, bu a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of business is. In other words, the only reason for making an investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so it means the United States government, it's very easy to tell how much you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments. It says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It could change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst, is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. When we buy, you know, some new machine for Shaw to make carpet, that's what we're thinking about, obviously, and you, you all learn that in business school. But it's the same thing for a big business. It, it, if you buy Coca-Cola today, the company is selling for about 100 and 10 to 15 billion dollars in the market. The question is, if you had 110 or 15 billion, you wouldn't be listening to me, but uh, I'd be listening to you incidentally. Uh, but the question is, would you lay it out today to get what the Coca-Cola company is going to deliver to you over the next two or 300 years? The discount rate doesn't make much difference after uh, as you get further out. But And that is a question of how much cash they're going to give you. It isn't a question of, you know, it isn't a question about how many analysts are going to recommend it or what the volume in the stock is or what the chart looks like or anything. It's a question of how much cash it's going to give you. That's the only reason. It's a true whether if you're buying a farm. It's true if you're buying an apartment house. Any financial asset. Oil in the ground. You're laying out cash now to get more cash back later on. And the question is, is how much are you going to get? When are you going to get it? And how sure are you? And when I calculate intrinsic value of a business... When we buy businesses, and whether we're buying all of a business or a little piece of a business, I always think we're buying the whole business because that's my approach to it. I look at it and say, what what will come out of this business and when? And what you really like, of course, is them to be able to use the money they earn and earn higher returns on it as you go along. I mean, Berkshire has never distributed anything to its shareholders, but its ability to distribute goes up as the value of the businesses we own increases. In Buffett's eyes, Intrinsic value is the forecasted cash a business would generate if one could predict the future, discounted appropriately. The essence of investing, he asserts, is laying out money now with the expectation of receiving more money later. Buffett emphasizes the challenge of evaluating stocks compared to bonds, where future cash flows are explicit. Applying this to Berkshire Hathaway's recent moves, Buffett questions whether laying out a substantial amount today aligns with the future cash Coca-Cola or any business might deliver. Crucially, Buffett introduces the impact of interest rates. He highlights the need to compare the return on cash against prevailing interest rates, stating that as rates rise, a stock yielding less than bonds may not be prudent. Buffett's investment litmus test revolves around three key questions. How certain are future cash flows, birds in the bush? When will they materialize, return rate? And how much will there be? These questions, he contends, are fundamental to investment decisions. 
These questions, as per Buffett, form the bedrock of investment decisions. Therefore, the stocks that didn't pass this meticulous analysis, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, UPS, and Mondelez International, were strategically pruned from the portfolio. Buffett's investment decisions are not whimsical. They are grounded in a time-tested philosophy. Now, let's unravel the reasons behind the three other stocks that Warren Buffett bid farewell to, each driven by distinct motives. Unlike the previous quartet, these decisions weren't centered on interest rates, but rather on cutting losses and securing potential profits. First in line is General Motors. Despite Buffett's affinity for buying stocks on sale, Berkshire Hathaway unloaded a substantial 22 million shares, valued at a staggering $850 million at the end of quarter two. This move, somewhat unusual for a value investor, signals a double blow for the automaker. Not only did it face a decline in share price from $40 to $33 by the quarter's end, which is an 18% drop, but Buffett's actions suggest a lack of confidence in GM's future strategy, particularly regarding electric vehicles. Adding to the skepticism, next year's profits are anticipated to be 8% lower than expected. In a strategic move, Buffett capitalized on potential gains by selling off his 14.5 million shares in Activision Blizzard just before Microsoft's complete acquisition. Now, while not insider trading, this maneuver likely took advantage of any market price discrepancies surrounding the takeover. It's a classic example of Buffett's adeptness in optimizing gains when market dynamics offer such opportunities. Buffett also tactically locked in gains on this chemical company Selenizes, selling off the entire position valued at around $620 million at the end of quarter two. The motivation behind this move aligns with the principle of securing profits when the market presents favorable conditions. As Berkshire Hathaway transforms its portfolio, shedding positions in companies perceived as uncertain or those ripe for profit taking, one question lingers. What is Buffett eyeing with the influx of cash? As a net seller of stocks in quarter three, Buffett predominantly turned to bonds, adopting a strategy reminiscent of putting money into high yield savings, aiming to earn returns that outpace inflation. Amidst the strategic sell-offs, Berkshire Hathaway's only significant purchase in quarter three was Sirius XM. Acquiring approximately 9.7 million shares worth around $44 million, the mere mention of Buffett's involvement had a notable impact on the stock's performance. Now, while speculation surrounds whether Buffett himself executed the purchase, it highlights the enduring Buffett effect, where his association with a stock can influence its market dynamics. And there you have it, folks. A deep dive into the mind of Warren Buffett, decoding his decision about parting with some of the key stocks in his portfolio. As always, investing is a journey, and understanding the strategies of great investors like Buffett provides invaluable insights. If you enjoyed this deep dive, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe for more financial insights, and ring that notification bell to stay updated. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. What's your take on Buffett's recent moves? And how do you interpret his strategy?